who were the top five most influential Koreans? About to talk about and discuss it, get into it right now. Let's go. Hey, what's up? Hercules Baxter back with another episode of Knowledge Dojo. Thank you guys for joining me. Here we go. The top five most influential Koreans. Man, really hard decision to make. Hey, look, I'm going to be honest with you guys right now. Done this video about three times already. This is like the fourth time we're trying to get this down. It's hard to narrow it, and that's the, that's the main problem. It's been a long video. Once you get into the discussion and talking about everybody, um, but we're trying to narrow it down, make it a short video. So, who are we talking about now? Top five most influential Koreans, all right? And we talk about the, from the beginning, in the early time period, when they first came over to America back in the early days, from the uh, early 60s and 70s, all right? So that's what we're gonna look at. The ones who came here and set a trend and influenced the art of Korean martial arts, martial arts period. Those are the people that we're looking at who had the most influence across the board. Okay, so let's talk about it real quick. Who's on the list? Number five, Duck Sung Sung. Bam, put him on number five. Duck Sung Sung hit the United States back in 1963 from from Korea. Before he before he came from before he came up to the states from Korea, he had beef with General Choi. That's crazy, man. Him and General Choi got into it over the name of Taekwondo. Everybody credits General Choi for being the person who created and came up with the name Taekwondo. Duck Song Song said, no, man. We came up with that joint together because he was at the meeting back in 1955 in Korea. All right. But he hits the States in 1963 and takes off. Start getting to do his thing, teaching Chundo Kwan all up and down the East Coast in the Midwest of the United States. In New York, all over New York, New York University at the YMCA in New Jersey. He starts teaching at the West Point uh, Military Academy. He does two back-to-back -back shows at the World Fair in New York in 1964 and 1965. Got a lot of people excited about the Korean martial arts. It was it was a phenomenon for him to hit to come to the States and to show off his skills and his techniques. He was on the cover of Esquire magazine back in 1965. So that gave more popularity to the art. And then in 1969, Duck Sung Sung wrote a book called Korean Karate, The Art of Taekwondo. That's right. Now, I know some of y'all confused like, what? Korean Karate? Why are you using the word karate? Y'all forget, man. It, it, it comes from Tung Sudo, you know, Taekwondo. From the old, so the senior masters, the founders training in Japan. Y'all got to do your research and look that up. All right, so Duck Sung Sung is spreading Korean karate all up and down the East Coast and all over New York. He's gaining a lot of students and a lot of followers. Very popular guy. Now, moving forward, back, moving forward, this is an interesting story that I learned. Uh, about 1971, 1970, um, this picture right here, you see of uh, Ki Wang Kim, General Choi, and June Ree. This picture was taken at Ki Wang Kim's studio in Silver Spring, Maryland. June Ree was there, uh, Duck Sung Sung was there as well, but you don't see him in the picture. General Choi came to the States to ask Ki Wang Kim, you know, to teach the new Taekwondo forms and this and that. Now, according to Sam Naples, this is the interesting part, Sam Naples, who was a reporter for the Taekwondo Times back then, said that they all went out to dinner after this, right. sit around, have a few drinks, have a good few laughs. Ducks at this time, then Duck Sung Sung turns to General Choi and says directly to his face, Oh, you supposed to be the father of Taekwondo? Really? Huh. Who gave you an honorary fifth degree black belt? Mm. Bold statement to make in front of all the other Koreans, all the senior black belts there. He put General Choi on the spot. According to Sam Naples, General Choi didn't respond. He had nothing to say to him. Matter of fact, what could he say to him? <laughs> But that was serious. That was a serious statement to put. To put you on a spot, to question your credentials, to question where you came from, who you trained with. And if you ain't got nothing to say, man, I don't, I don't know. But anyway, that's why we put Duck Sung Sung at number five. Very influential in the beginning of the movement of Korean martial arts when he came to the States. A lot of students, he throws a lot of people to black belt. Influence a lot of people all up and down the east coast of uh, America. All right, now number four on the list Guy Wan Moon. Straight up, 
Daiwan Moon came to the States back in 1962. Houston, Texas is where he landed. And what did he do as soon as he landed? Took off. He hit the scene, the local martial arts scene. He started competing in Texas, Nevada, New Mexico, California, Utah. Everywhere. He started going around, putting his name down on the map. And that's why he became popular and very well respected. Now, here's the thing. Here's the thing that y'all guys got to know. If you ask any of the senior masters, go ask any of your senior instructors. They would tell you that back in the early days, you didn't see too many Koreans getting on the floor and competing with the Americans. When they came here, they was like, mm, nah, I'm going to just teach. No, I'm an instructor. And I'm, talking, I'm not talking about the, the older Koreans. I'm talking about the young Koreans. Daiwan Moon was young. He was 22 when he hit the States. All right. And what he do, he gets right on the floor and go toe to toe with some of the heavy hitters out there. Like Joe Lewis, Joe Hayes, uh, Bill Wallace. He goes toe to toe with all these guys, beating most of them, taking the grand championship and coming, you know, bringing home the title putting the name, putting his name down in America. So that's why he's on the list. Very, very respected martial artist. And then he started teaching. 1969, what did he do? He moves to Mexico, becomes the father of Taekwondo in Mexico. He builds up the Taekwondo team, gets millions of people involved in Taekwondo today. There are 1.3 million people in Mexico that are practicing Taekwondo. Muda Kwong, from where? Dai Wan Moon, all right, 1973, he trains the Mexican Taekwondo team that goes over to Korea and competes in the first World Taekwondo Championships. And how did they do? Very, very well. <laughs> they did very well. In fact, Albert, according to Albert Cheeks, when he was at the tournament, he said he looked across the room and he saw the Mexican team and he saw the instructor was Daiwan Moon. He tapped Mike Warren right away. Hey, Mike, look. He said their coach is Daiwan Moon. They all was like, huh? Because <laughs> they knew Daiwan Moon was not to be trifled with. He was a serious fighter. And they knew that their students, their students was going to be a serious fighter. And sure enough, their students, they, the Mexican team put in work bringing home the bronze medal, bringing home two silver medals individually. It was the Mexican, here's, here's, here's the interesting part, interesting thing. The Americans sent three teams, East Coast, West Coast, and the Midwest, all right? On the first night of elimination for team sparring, the Midwest and West Coast got eliminated by who? The Mexican team. <laughs> That's how that's how serious and that's how hard they went. The other the, the other American teams didn't even get make it through the preliminaries. All right, so Daiwan Moon trained them guys, trained them well, and still to this day in Mexico, the millions of people practicing Taekwondo and they trace their trace their lineage back to Daiwan Moon. They get credit to Daiwan Moon for bringing the Taekwondo to Mexico. So once again, had to put them on the list. Came to America, spread the Korean arts and got a name for itself, got a lot of students and following, and also promoted the Korean arts down in Mexico, made a big, huge following, millions and millions and millions of students. So you cannot pass Daiwan Moon. Great, great, great guy. All right, going now, number three now, number three on the list, Beyond Young Yu. That's right, man, Beyond Young Yu hit the States back in 1968. As soon as he hit the States, what did he do? Start working hard, putting in work. You know, he's washing dishes at night, and he was working mornings on the farm, picking picking vegetables. And then he yo know, he had to go back wash dishes. So he what did he do? He's like, man, this is this this is hard, man. He starts saving up his money to he open up a studio, open up a studio in Berkeley, California. What did he do? He got a few students, and then he started going to tournaments, putting his name on the map, going around California. Fall down the West Coast, then bounce it to the East Coast. Bai ba Young Yu was very, very famous back then. He was known as a skilled technician, one of the baddest Koreans to hit the States in the late 60s. Hands down, he was winning championship after championship in fighting and in forms. On top of that, he just didn't fight. He also did forms and also took home the championship. One of the most toughest tournaments that he won was Henry Cho's All-American Open. 
Yup, that's right. Bae Young Yu took home the Grand Championship. He beat Mike Warren back in 1971 for the Grand Champion title. Bae Young Yu was a fierce fighter. And also, he was a fierce instructor. Who did he teach? Howard Jackson. You ever heard of Howard Jackson? Come on now. Go punch yourself in the face. Seriously. Howard Jackson, back in 1973, won 12 Grand Championship titles that year alone. And who did he train with? Beyond Young Yu. Man, the guy was good. Back in 1971, Beyond Young Yu started opening his own school. Three years later, he had 2,000 students. Jeez. 2000 <laughs> just in three years he had two locations man the guy was spreading the korean arts teaching his muda kwang he was very popular a great instructor and a great competitor so that's why he made number three on the list here we go number two on the list real quick number two june re hands down i mean what can you say there's no argument about Come on, you gotta put June Ree on this. You can't miss June Ree, all right? June Ree hit the stage back in 1958, all right? Cam comes over, starts teaching Chun Do Kwang Tung Soo Do. Years later, a couple of years later, when the Koreans started coming up with the name Taekwondo and start wanting to promote Taekwondo, June Ree joins in, switch to Ch Taekwondo, starts teaching. Now, think about June Ree. He started, he started creating his own forms. He changed from Chun Do Kwan, he changed to teach his own style of Taekwondo. He started doing musical forms. That's the guy who introduced musical forms. I, he was the first one to put, bring in musical forms. He had tournaments on the East Coast and, and in the Midwest, in Texas. Huge tournaments that people used to go to all the time. Some top fighters in America came out of June Reed School, okay? Pat Worley was one of them. Joe Corley was one of them. Jeff Smith was one of them. These guys were serious. When they hit the tournament, you, they, they went hard. They was going for the title. They was like, we're not going home empty-handed. Regardless, yes, June Reed brought in some real fighters. Now, another thing that June Reed came out with that he helped bring forth was the protection gear. Everybody knows protection gear. And yes, it started with June Reed. But June Reed had a little inspiration. Here's Albert Cheeks talking about it. We were fair notice. I said, June Reed brought Pat Worley up to try to be the answer to Mike Warren. And Jeff Smith was supposed to be the answer to me. And they came from Texas, so they fought with their hands down. And we were like, they got to be kidding. And Mike Warren hit Pat Worley with a hip kick and broke his jaw. Mm -hmm. I, I remember that. Yeah. You, I mean, it, 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 it went like, you heard it outside the... So there you have it. Yes. Mike Warren helped inspire June Reed to come out with that protection gear. So June Reed was inducted into the Taekwondo Hall of Fame in 2007. All right. June Reed was a phenomenal instructor. Okay. Phenomenal martial artist. Um, so that's why he's put at number two, because he had a huge impact in the martial arts ever since he came to America. All right, now, number one, here we go. Number one on the list, Ki Wang Kim. Hands down, after the survey we put out, I sent out an email to several master instructors on the East Coast and on the West Coast. They put Ki Wang Kim at the top of the list. Hands down, he hit the States in 1963. When he comes to America, he was the highest ranking Korean to hit the States, all right? He already had an eighth degree black belt when he came here. Crazy. Ki Wang Kim trained some of the top fighters that came out of America. And y'all pretty sure you all know their names. Mitchell Barbaro, George Thanos, Mike Warren, Albert Chief, John Crystal, Sadie White. Q Sung Wong, Greg Battle, Masada Bird, Ray Lee. The list goes on and on and on and on and on and on. All right, a lot of grand champions produced out of Kim's studios. Matter of fact, Jimmy Roberts was the one who won eight grand championship titles and forms at Henry Cho's All American Open eight years in a row. No one has done that yet. All right, Ki Wayne Kim set a major contribution into the martial arts. How did he do that? They started off 
Axe Kick. Kiway Kim was the one who introduced Axe Kicks and Sparring. People wasn't even doing that back then. There's a little article right here from Sam Naples mentioning that Kiway Kim was the. You have to give credit to Kiway Kim for bringing the, creating the Axe Kick. That came out of Kim Studios. Another thing, lead leg kicks. People were knocking people out back then with lead leg kicks. Most of the kicks came off the rear leg. It was students from Kim Studio who was using the lead leg, <laughs> knocking people out with that with the lead leg kicks. In fact, here's Albert Cheeks talking about it. Okay, their guests. We'll let them move. And so now we beat all of their brown belts. Now it gets to the black belts. Bernard is throwing a double round kick and he's touching the guy. Mike is throwing a hook round like over the guy's head, touching him on the face. And I am throwing a reverse horse kick, spin kick. They stop the tournament with Master Kim sitting at the head table in front of everybody and said, uh, The three fighters that are in the ring are guests and they do not understand that the techniques that they're using must have power enough to knock somebody out. And these kicks are just flapping in the air. <laughs> Where's the kids sit at the table look at us and do this? Same technique, close the eyes. <laughs> you hear Bernard's, you hear some go, cat, cat, right there. Might the one hit the guy on both sides of the head. Cat, cat. And I'm in the ring dancing, looking at Bernard. Well, damn. <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, this guy's not going to see this. And I raised my lead foot like I was going to kick, and he dropped his hand, and I threw the spin kick right in his face. Pow! So now all three are knocked out right after they just said our techniques had no power. That's right. So it was something new. It was something that they brought out, that they brought forth. Everybody didn't think. Back then, people didn't, didn't, uh, didn't figure that the lead leg had power. So it was more the rear leg, all right? Next thing they bring forth was movement while you're sparring, not standing still. It was used to, see back then, if you, again, if you look at any video from the 60s and the early 70s, you see people stood still when they sparred, they didn't move around. They didn't at all. Matter of fact, here's an article from Black Belt Magazine in the 1970s describing Mike Warren and Joe Hayes moving around. People in the crowd started laughing. They're like, why are these guys jumping around like a jumping bean? What is going on? They wasn't used to seeing that. It was the students from Kim's studio who started that movement. Now we see all across the board, people doing what? Jumping when they, moving when they sparring, bouncing when they sparring. No matter if they're doing it in karate or if they're doing it in Korean, Taekwondo, Tung Sudo, uh, it's all across the board. They doing it every, all everywhere now, okay? So those are some of the things that started, that Ki Wang Kim bring out. Also, moving and sliding in, off the slide and then when you kick started with Kim Studios all right came for the students from Kim Studios as well a major influence in the martial arts across martial arts styles is one of the reasons why we had to put them at the top of the list in 1971 Ki Wang Kim was promoted to ninth degree black belt by the KTA the Korean Taekwondo Association again making him even the highest <laughs> black Korean black belt in America at this time all the other Koreans were only six seventh degree if that most of them were fifth and sixth all right Ki Wang Kim was ninth degree black belt on top of that Ki Wang Kim had trained directly under Toyama Khan Ken over in Japan but most of the Koreans that came over they trained under other Koreans all right Ki Wang Kim before Ki Wang Kim passed away in 1993 again the, the Korean Taekwondo Association promoted him to 10th degree black belt make the first the first one to get the 10th degree title in 1993 before any other Korean master. He was definitely a huge influence. He had respect among his peers, not only the Koreans, but also the Japanese masters as well. So he helped push the Korean art for, further. He had influence, had big influence in the martial arts community, produced champion after champion. All right, you guys, that's it from Hercules Baxter. Thanks for joining me on another episode of the Knowledge Dojo. Yo, join me again next week. Leave your comments and your 
your thoughts below. Tell me what you think. Tell me who should have been on the list. I know there are a lot of good Koreans out there that should have been on the list that could have made the list. I didn't put them on there. I mean, like Richard Chung should have been on the list that people might think. Um, but hey, you got to go through the criteria, man. It's a, There's a lot of good Koreans out there, man. It was, it, was, it was a hard, hard decision to make, but had to whittle it down somehow. But yo, go ahead. Leave me your comments. Tell me what you think. Tell me how you feel. And see you guys next week.